I might look like, um, I might not look like, at least I hope I don't look like David Myers. <laughs> not David Myers. Um, David Myers is the CEO uh, at AIR, and um, he would typically be here to welcome you all today, but uh, is actually a little bit under the weather. I'm Sabrina Lane, I'm Chief of Staff, and um, I'm stepping in to um, welcome this amazing crowd. We are delighted to have such a good turnout for this event, both um, external partners, friends, and colleagues, as well as um, a great showing of AIR staff. So welcome everyone uh, to, the, uh, to today's um, event. What uh, I think I'm particularly excited about um, at least connecting for all of you as a very brief introduction is um, how this, how well this event fits um, with AIR's mission. Um, for those of you who don't uh, know AIR's mission, it is to conduct and connect uh, the best behavioral and social science research um, with improving people's lives and uh, with special focus on the disadvantaged. Um, and it also uh, connects really beautifully with um, our new strategic direction. As an organization, we recognize that we've traditionally done work in issues like um, education, health, social development, um, workforce, and we address all of those issues uh, with various clients, with various um, folks in the field who are affected by our research and by the services that we provide. Uh, but we don't do a very good job traditionally of connecting across all of those issues and looking at um, the particular problems faced by individuals, faced by families, faced by communities, and how we can, how we can connect uh, some of those solutions uh, to have a better impact, a longer lasting impact. And so I think part of what we're going to be talking about today are some of those connections um, that help us get to longer lasting, more effective solutions. So that's my quick introductory spiel about AIR. Uh, we are actually celebrating our 70th anniversary next year. That's how long AIR has been around. So that's pretty exciting. I'm guessing there's not very many staff in the room who actually knew that. Um, and you'll hear more about that if you're uh, at AIR in the next few months. So my real role up here is to introduce our facilitator today. And we're very honored to have Christina Samuels here from Education Week, one of our very favorite publications here at AIR. We always closely monitor to see whether or not any of AIR's work is being covered uh, <laughs> any given week in Education Week. Um, Christina has worked at uh, Education Week since 2004. She covers special education and um, early childhood education issues there. She previously uh, worked at the Washington Post and the Miami Herald um, and is a strong advocate for these issues. So Christina, I'm going to hand this over to you. I'd um, just like to remind everyone that there are there's a reception following today's um, panel discussion and everyone here is invited. I think we actually have some summer themed cocktails that we are <laughs> going to try out on you all. So you can't vouch for how good they are or what they are, but you're invited to try them nonetheless. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me here to uh, moderate this really important panel. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Christina Samuels, and I'm a reporter with Education Week. And uh, I'm going to put this down just a bit. This is right in my eye. Uh, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. My professional interest in early childhood education began when my paper asked me to take over this beat after I returned from maternity leave in 2013. And as you can imagine, my interest in child development was extremely intense <laughs> at that time. And so it was a perfect time for me to take over this beat. And I often joke that I use my interviews as sort of a, a secret way for me to ask experts for parenting advice. Like, what would you do for a two-year-old just any two-year-old, but say a two-year-old. Um, many of you already know Education Week, and I'm glad to hear that. It's the nation's premier newspaper of record for pre-K to 12 education, and my publisher, Ginny Edwards, would of course want me to mention that. 
And uh, when I first started covering early childhood, my assumption then w was that my focus would be on kindergarten up to third grade with some forays into um, articles about preschool policy. And in reality, I've written stories about early education for four-year-olds, early education for three-year-olds, early education for two-year-olds, child care programs, home visiting programs. The whole spectrum of a child's early life is potentially open to me for story ideas, and that's because scientists and researchers understand how every part of a child's early life, both good <laughs> and bad, is connected to their later school performance and, of course, their later life experiences. So the concern about the effect of toxic stress on young children was new to me when I started covering the beat, but it is not new to researchers and certainly not new to early childhood educators. Uh, recently, I heard the owner of a Baltimore child care center speaking about working with children whose behaviors were so challenging that she was losing staff. And the owner said, these kids aren't just born bad. Why are they acting like this? And then it dawned on me, the environment. These kids are exposed to stuff that some of us in a lifetime have never seen. So public policy is catching up with what people on the ground already know and have known for some time. For example, federal home visiting programs were recently reauthorized, and many home visiting programs, as you know, specifically work with families that are experiencing the challenges that uh, come with toxic stress, that lead to toxic stress. There's also been a tremendous amount of attention recently paid to the issue of preschool suspensions and expulsions. And to address these issues, organizations have launched programs that help teachers and other early childhood uh, personnel recognize stress in their students so that they can help them instead of asking them to leave the school. And incidentally, some of these programs I find interesting also help teachers recognize their own stress because of, there is a connection between preschool suspension rates and the amount of stress that a teacher said that she feels in her job. So there's so much more to say on this topic, and that's why I'm happy to introduce uh, Dr. Sabella Raver, the Vice Provost for Research and Faculty Affairs at New York University. Uh, Dr. Raver's research explores early learning and development among low-income children, and as part of that work, she has extensive experience on the impact of toxic stress and what can be done to lessen those impacts on young children. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Raver. Thank you. It's really an honor um, and a pleasure to be here. I'm so blown away by the size of this crowd and also for the real elegance and eloquence of uh, Christina's introduction. She um, nailed it. I feel like, okay, well, the communication skill that was just demonstrated here means that I don't actually have very much work to do or that my work has been substantially um, lessened. So thank you, Christina, for that fantastic introduction. Um, I'm sure that many of you have had frontline um, experience working in um, low-income communities and serving uh, low-income families uh, and know the tremendous resources that um, communities and families have and that they bring to um, serving young children. Um, I'm going to first talk a little bit about the stresses that families face and children face and then a lot about solutions that um, we can really uh, deploy to support kids. Um, so bear with me while I first talk about the glass half empty and then we can talk a lot about the glass half full and how to fill it. Now, of course, the challenge is to figure out where to point the mirror. Aha. Good. So some of you may be a little bit familiar with my work or maybe not. Um, my work initially started as many developmental psychologists did. Um, really thinking about systems and, um, and within the child and within the family, really focusing on children's cognitive self-regulation and their um, emotional uh, self-regulation. And then really thinking about how families uh, are really supporting that and the ways in that which it leads not only to achievement but also to children's engagement in their communities as leaders, uh, as really good citizens, as good uh, participants with each other. Um, what's really important though, and unfortunately the text is a little off on these boxes and I apologize, um, it's really important for us to then place those in the context of neighborhoods and schools. And so we're really going to try to unpack that a little bit in today's talk. And most importantly then to think about that in the context of poverty and in terms of policy. So what do I do in my work? I really try to leverage neuroscience to understand the costs of exposure to poverty related toxic stress. And then really think about leveraging prevention science, an incredibly important area of social science research, to understand the policy options that we have to support resilience in the face of high risk. Um, when I start speaking, because I'm from New York, I speak really fast. So I really <laughs> hope that you stop and interrupt me as much as possible um, so that I can slow down so that you can get questions answered. But that's basically the overview for today's talk. 
And I always start talks with this slide. If you've ever seen me talk before, I apologize for the redundancy. But the very first thing that I try to do is to place um, the, the uh, work <coughs> I'm going to talk about in the context of poverty. So the first thing that you should notice about this graph, and the first thing that I'll point out, is the number of kids um, in poverty in the US today. Often when I give um, talks about poverty, the audience might think that it's a very small proportion of the population, but I think many of you in this audience know that actually it's about a quarter of the population when you think about children under the age of six. So that's the magenta uh, bouncing dot. If uh, you look at the graph on the right-hand side, uh, you'll see that 20.7%, that's all children under 18. And of course the number is a little bit, the percentage is a little bit older when you include older kids because their parents are older and they earn more but the rate is actually 25% if you look at kids under the age of six. The second reason that I show this graph, it's really, really important to me to show, is because of that orange dot. So does everybody see that orange dot that says 65 years or older? And you can see that in the 1950s, 1959, that orange dot was a lot higher than the magenta dot, right? That the rate of poverty among the elderly was actually a lot higher than the rate of, of poverty among young children. But you'll notice that that line actually precipitously drops from about 35% all the way down to about 8.9%, right? So it's really important for us to note that that poverty rate changed for the elderly while it did not change for children. Anyone want to hazard a guess for why it changed for the elderly? Social Security. Social Security. <laughs> social Security, and in fact, actually largely um, changes in Social Security policy and transfers um, uh, that were really uh, pushed by the American Association of Retired Persons, a lobbying organization that was started by a retired teacher, a woman actually a retired principal. Um, so it's just really important for us to highlight that poverty is not a natural state. Um, it is not just a situation that children are born into. It is a situation that we actually have some control over through anti-poverty policy. And as I talk, I'm gonna be really pushing the point that we have a lot of ways in which we think about helping children in poverty what I refer to as more oars in the water to help row against the tide of poverty. But I also want to really point to the idea of turning the tide, actually trying to reduce poverty for low-income families while we also think about how to help low-income families. So with that, why should we actually think about children's socio-emotional development? Poverty sounds like a really attractable problem. I've just tried to argue that it's not, and maybe we shouldn't be looking at kids' emotions. We should be thinking about teaching kids. Well. In fact, there is a really huge achievement gap between high-income and low-income kids, and that achievement gap has grown, so that's a serious problem. Um, so just an example um, from uh, the Early Childhood Longitudinal Survey, which I learned is actually managed by AER, um, by Christine, which is totally impressive. Uh, if you look at those data, you see that the children who are arriving uh, into kindergarten from low-income households are substantially at, uh, at academic disadvantage relative to their no income and their more affluent peers. And when you look at um, what we do as a federal and uh, in state um, policy, you see that there's a lot of emphasis on trying to close that gap by putting a lot of uh, resources to teaching kids early language, early math, and early reading, all of which are very important to do. But interestingly, while a number of those academically oriented um, interventions have yielded evidence of some gain, there's a whole new generation of emphasis on socio-emotional learning. So how many people have been hearing more about non-cognitive factors? Yes, there's increasing interest in non-cognitive factors, which is a lumpy way of saying children's social and emotional skills, children's self-regulation skills. Why is that? Well, part of the reason that we emphasize that is because of the idea that you can't actually get a lot of traction on children's learning and academic outcomes without focusing on their socio-emotional outcomes. And while we used to make that case on the, on the sense of intuition and teachers' uh, practical experience and behavioral data, we now have a lot more evidence from neuroscience, and I'm gonna show you that now. I can remember what I did before. Okay, good. So how do we think about children's socio-emotional skills uh, we specifically think about self-regulation as this key lens through which we can understand uh, kids' emotional and uh, behavioral uh, control in classroom situations. And we unpack that in two ways. One is that we use this construct called executive function, which also sounds like a really wonky academic term because it is. But it basically just means how do you regulate cognitively? How do you focus your attention? How do you use your working memory to remember it, what it is that you're supposed to do next? And how do you actually inhibit your impulses so that you can do those things? 
And you can think about that in a classroom situation, right? So if a teacher says to a whole four-year-old classroom, they're all scattered around the room playing with tons and tons of objects and tons of toys, and the teacher says, okay, everybody, I want you to put away your toys, I want you to go to your cubbies, get your coats, and get in line, right? What do those little kids think about? They're like starstruck, right? First of all, somebody's talking. So they have to attend. Then they have to think about what the teacher just said. She just said a whole list of a lot of things. They have to remember what it is that the teacher asked. The teacher said to go to your cubby. No, wait, the teacher said put away your toys, right? So they have to use their working memory to remember. And then they will have to do the most hard thing. If you have a preschooler, you know this well. But adults have trouble inhibiting their control and their impulses too, right? Which is? Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> which is they have to stop what they really want to do and start doing what they're not so sure they want to do, which is to line up or to get their coats, right? That inhibitory control is extremely difficult for four-year-olds because they're developing a key portion of their brain, the prefrontal cortex, that really manages a lot of those portions of that behavioral repertoire. So that's called executive function. That's what it looks like when you look at it in a lab. And it turns out that executive function actually predicts kids' academic performance far better than IQ. And it also turns out beautifully that it's very plastic, it's very malleable. So what your executive function is at one year in one point of time is not necessarily predictive of what your executive function is later. It's actually very amenable to environmental change and input. And that means some good things, and it also means some not so good things. So I'll try to outline. Yes, a question. I was going to say, um, considering the fact that addressing some of the issues you've been talking about does come from a policy-oriented perspective, I was curious if you could speak to the role of AIR and also your role, I mean, and, 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 like how to, how to move this forward because of the fact that policy making and uh, policy change is a slow-moving process. And if you could a little bit more to that. Sure. I will hopefully get, uh, so the question was, um, well, the question was, can you speak to the policy process and how we can mobilize the policy process or deal with, uh, or how can AIR mobilize the policy process given that it moves so slowly? And I will note that I'm in the middle of some very like, thick developmental biological information policy not relevant yet. Mm -hmm. So if you'll hang in, I will hopefully move swiftly to the policy implications of this particular point about kids' brain development. And how we could actually mobilize policy more quickly is actually a topic of another talk, uh, which is more about the connections between science, policy, and action. Um, but I hope to get somewhat close to that toward the end. Good. Great question. OK, so there we are in the prefrontal cortex. It turns out the prefrontal cortex is very connected to another set of uh, limbic structures deeper in the brain that really manage kids' emotion regulation, how you manage distress, how you manage feelings of fear, anxiety, and frustration. So you might imagine it's a lot harder to listen to instructions, to follow those instructions, and to in inhibit your impulses when you're really upset. And preschoolers know this really well. But we do too, right? When you're trying to get out the door, and you're really stressed out, and you just come off of you know getting frustrated with your four-year-old, it's hard to remember where you're keys are. It's hard to remember whether you packed your child's lunch, right? Those things are difficult when you're under emotional stress. So it turns out that that's because there's a tremendous amount of circuitry between the limbic parts of the brain and the prefrontal cortical parts of the brain, which don't sound relevant to policy, but they will be in just a second, because they're both really affected by poverty-related stress. Okay, so how are they affected by poverty-related stress? It turns out that there's been a large literature, including some of the studies that we've contributed, that show that kids exposed to more cumulative years of poverty show lower executive function. So specifically, when I graph or a sample of 1,200 kids who have experienced varying levels of poverty, if I graph their executive function on the y-axis, on the up and down part of the graph, you can see that um, kids who experienced only zero years of poverty um, have a much higher executive function than kids who have one year of poverty, two years of poverty, and three years of poverty. It's what we call a dose-dependent relationship. And this is controlling for kids' uh, birth outcomes and for family situations when kids were born. So we can rule out this concern that we often have, or not rule it out, but lower it, this concern for what we call selection bias, that kids who are in more poor circumstances are also facing a lot of biological or physiological issues that are just different than kids who end up less poor. 
what it, what it suggests is that poverty is actually having a deleterious effect on kids' executive function. And we have some evidence for how that's actually happening. The way that we think that that's actually happening is that the stressors associated with poverty are increasing the wear and tear on their cardiovascular and their um, HPA axis, basically on the way that they release stress hormones in their bodies. Um, and that those serve as what we call biomediators uh, on brain development. It's this idea that poverty-related stress is getting under the skin, so to speak, and it's actually affecting brain development. And we have a lot of evidence to support that hypothesis. Now, does that mean that every kid in poverty is going to have these negative consequences? Absolutely not. It just increases the probability that a teacher in a Head Start in a highly disadvantaged community is going to see more kids with problems like this than a teacher in a private, well-funded preschool where kids are not experiencing the same level of stresses. So what do we do to actually support kids who are experiencing that? It turns out that we can really leverage the malleability of executive function by supporting kids in their preschool environments. And so I ran a randomized control trial that was funded by NICHD with my colleagues, Steph Jones and a number of others, where we actually randomly assigned Head Start preschools to receiving multi-component supports specifically to help children's self-regulation, to help them with inhibitory control, to help them with modulating their emotions, to help them with planning, et cetera by mostly helping their teachers. And the way that we did that was that we taught teachers a lot about self-regulation and how to support self-regulation. We actually focused on teachers' own stress in the way that Christine pointed out, basically suggesting that, or thinking that teachers were gonna have a hard time supporting young children's emotion regulation if they themselves were really dysregulated. And by really providing a mental health consultant to get in there and coach to show teachers, yeah, this is what you learned last Friday in your in-service training, but this is how you put it into practice on Monday when we've got 22 little kids running around, some of whom are really having a hard time. So that coaching turned out to be extremely important. We did this with 18 Head Start sites, 90 teachers, and about 600 kids in communities experiencing a lot of um, uh, disadvantage in Chicago. And what we found was great, which was a huge relief for many of us, but also really important for long-term policy, which specifically showed not only improvements in the classroom, so you can see this is on the class measurement, so I don't know if any of you are really familiar with this uh, standardized uh, observational tool used in preschool classrooms, but it's now used nationally in many, many different types of preschool settings. And we showed substantial benefits for the positive climate of the classroom. The climate of the classroom meant that kids were better regulated and teachers were managing the classroom more effectively. Lots less yelling, a lot more teacher sensitivity. But really importantly, we found significant benefits for children's executive function all the way on the left-hand side of that graph and for their attention and let lower impulsivity. And we also found benefits for their language and letter naming and early math. And PPBT there stands for the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, a standard measure of language. What that means is that supporting kids' self-regulation without giving any extra li uh, literacy or math curriculum boosted kids' early literacy and math skills. Kids were able to perform better on things that they were learning because they were actually in a better place emotionally, behaviorally, and cognitively. So what had happened when they went to elementary school? We found that actually we were facing a huge problem. It has a huge number of policy implications and a huge number of research implications which was the kids scattered from our 18 preschool sites to over 160 schools, kindergartens, some of which were great and some of which were terrible. As in any large city, kindergarten quality is going to range quite dramatically. Um, importantly, families were still in neighborhoods that were experiencing high rates of poverty and high rates of crime, um, and schools uh, were sometimes not necessarily very safe, were actually themselves relatively chaotic. And we realized that children were exposed to a whole second treatment of higher versus lower school quality uh, and ongoing exposure to neighborhood stressors. What did that mean? That meant that it was really naive and optimistic for me to think that I could give kids a single dose in preschool, like an inoculation, and send them on their way thinking that they were going to be fine. I had to actually think through how that was going to be against this, con of, again, this tide of stressors that kids were going to face. So that that was a really unrealistic expectation. Unless I could figure out how to build in systems of support earlier in their lives in terms of their families and supports later in their lives in terms of school quality. So that effort that AAR is thinking about pursuing or is pursuing in terms of transitions to kindergarten and kindergarten quality and also thinking about supporting uh, parenting and parenting interventions prior to preschool is exactly right from the sense of uh, what I've learned empirically here. 
Okay, so what do we mean by toxic stress? We might want to really stop for a minute and unpack that if we're really going to think about policy implications. We've been able to follow our families now through um, their children's age um, uh, 13. Uh, we're gearing up to see them again this year when they are actually 15. It's super exciting. Um, in doing that, we've learned a lot about families' lives, and we've learned that um, poverty in terms of income is just the beginning of what families face in our sample among our 600 families. Um, specifically, they face the psychological strain of uh, trouble making ends meet, uh, which we know a lot about because of a really important literature that suggests that how you think about the stressors that you're facing um, has a lot to do with how you can weather them. Um, and it's not to say you should just keep on the sunny side of life, but that uh, going without has actually deleterious consequences for how you're able to frame your current situation and explains a lot for why um, parents can often become depressed. Substandard and crowded, crowded housing turn out to be increasingly, in our data, really important, um, particularly in cities like New York where the housing markets are so constrained. So thinking about being able to provide people with safe and, and, and sufficient space is actually non-trivial. And then really importantly, thinking about exposure to violence. So increasingly we're finding evidence um, from clinically oriented research on PTSD of the neurobiology of being exposed to violence. And specifically when I was talking about the circuitry in the brain of the linkage between um, your emotion regulation and your cognitive function, this has serious um, implications for um, that connection. So if you're exposed a lot to threatening situations, it actually triggers a level of vigilance that has a lot of physiological as well as behavioral consequences. Kids have a harder time interpreting ambiguous stimuli in their environments that make it harder for them to respond in pro-social ways while also having that wear and tear impact on their systems. So just as an example, with our sample, we were able to follow our kids when they were in third grade. First of all, we capitalized on in preschool and in third grade. We were able to um, basically measure, because it turned out that it was relatively random when we actually uh, were able to um, assess our kids, we were able to map our data onto um, their exposure to violent crimes in their neighborhoods. And one of my graduate students uh, worked with a colleague, Pat Sharkey, to actually map where every kid lived and where every shooting occurred. Heard. And we were able to find out when kids were exposed to shootings right before we assessed them versus when there was a shooting in their neighborhood that happened right after they were assessed. That actually serves amazingly as a terrible but real natural experiment because we could then compare those two groups of kids to see what was the impact of a shooting on their executive function because we have those data, right? So it turns out that we found clear evidence of the impact of a shooting uh, that occurred within a uh, thousand feet of kids' homes on kids' attention and on their impulse control. A clear experimental piece of evidence of the impact of violence on kids' lives, on specifically their neurocognitive function. And one of my graduate students then went on to take the fifth grade data and she mapped all of the places that kids lived. She mapped all of the places where there were homicides. By the way, there were 917 homicides that year in our children's experience. Um, and 58,000 violent crimes. So we're talking about a non-trivial number of uh, violent crimes for these kids uh, and for their communities. What year is this? This is um, in fifth grade, so that would have been six years after 2004, so that would have been 2010. In Chicago? Chicago, yes. And you can see our kids live in neighborhoods of high concentrations of violence um, and crime, very scary for us and for their kids, the, our kids particularly. Importantly, that our kids are clearly experiencing, as we can see from their data, uh, not only higher exposure to crime, but when they have higher exposure to crime, they have higher difficulty with attention and impulsive behavior on a task, a neurocognitive task that we use to assess their response to threatening stimuli. And importantly, children who were um, exposed to more crime were more anxious and sad, and especially those kids were more vulnerable. So the impact of toxic stress is really uh, real, not only in preschool, but throughout their schooling. And the policy implication is that crime or anti-crime policing is not just a safety issue, it's an education issue. So we found clear evidence that it disrupts kids' attention. A colleague of ours showed that it disrupts kids' academic achievement on standardized tests when a shooting occurs just before that test is administered, right? It's really, really critical that we then recognize that when mayoral leaders 
for state leaders push uh, 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 safety in communities as, a, as an issue, that they can have the tools to recognize that that's an education issue, not just a, a safety issue. I hope that's clear. <coughs> So um, what does this all say? Specifically, the poverty-related risks are depleting. There's some really cool and important work that highlights the ways in which it really makes it difficult for people to make decisions and think through situations when they're experiencing threatening, turbulent environments. I'm going to fast forward quickly through that slide to just talk about what uh, districts can do. So the very first thing that we can think about with, in terms of district effort is this, uh, this idea of more ores in the water. And because my world is in preschool, I'm going to tell you why I think preschool is a good solution to that. So specifically, district-level investments in preschool provide students with stronger chances for resilience in the face of uh, risk, particularly during the sensitive period of brain development. So just going back to the very beginning of my talk, when I talked about the reading gap between low-income children and high-income children, if you think about that in terms of SAT-like units, it's about 100 points. Um, Boston pre-K actually substantially reduced that gap between rich and poor kids by half. So it was a really major impact that that Boston pre-K had in supporting children's executive function and, and positive function in that community. How does that work? How does why, why is that? Why? Work? Because kids are in really safe, really positive environments. They're helping to really uh, promote and support their self-regulation and executive function. Teachers are really well trained in that system. They get a lot of coaching, a lot of support for maintaining very high quality classroom environments. And it's free, so low income kids can go. So that it's not stratified by income in the way many preschool programs that are not free and not public would. Great question. Yes. Are these skills that respond to practice and repetition, like the marshmallow test? Yes, yeah, so idea? thanks for asking that. It turns out um, it's the idea of neuroplasticity is really hot, so you can put kids in front of computer games and they can actually, with repetition, develop executive function skills on the basis of things like computer games, but they can't transfer those skills from the computer game-based platform to the classroom platform when kids are grabbing their toys and teachers are talking and there's a lot of ambient sound, right? It turns out that's a great short-term solution, and it may be a really helpful clinical solution for a very small stripe of kid, but it's not super helpful for a population-based approach, at least from the perspective of me and some other people who think about this. So just to highlight New York City and give a shout out to the de Blasio administration, they're recently launching a dramatic expansion of UPK um, to serve 53,000 kids. Um, we're cur currently collaborating with um, another uh, firm to provide comprehensive research for that, really thinking about that as a population-based public health effort to really reduce inequality, not simply a way to support um, early learning, though that's a super important outcome too. Um, we really are very interested in this as a, as a key uh, uh, citywide approach to inequality. Why do we think that this makes a big difference? Um, well, when we look at things like Tools of the Mind, which is a play-based intervention uh, implemented, um, it's a, developed by uh, Debbie Leong and Alana Budrova uh, in New York City kindergartens. This is with uh, my colleague Clancy Blair. Um, we actually see small effects in kindergarten for the population as a whole, but really big effects for when we look at English language learners who are disproportionately low income uh, and uh, low income kids uh, in, in the city. So the impacts are often uh, found to be larger for kids who need the intervention most. Oops. How am I doing on time, Evan? I'm oh, good, I've got five minutes. Cool. So uh, what do we know from these studies? How can we kind of wrap this into something that makes sense for thinking more broadly? Um, we specifically really want to think about policies and programs that serve children ages 0 to 5 that actively capitalize on this uh, classic neuroscientific finding, um, the idea that supportive adults can make a massive difference in supporting children's emotion regulation and their cognitive regulation. Um, the presence of a supportive adult dramatically reduces the biological stress response as well as the experience of anxiety for individuals facing a major challenge or stressor. So I don't know how many of you got a flu shot, did anybody get a flu shot this spring? It's like no longer a Pokemon to get a flu shot. But if you got a flu shot, did the nurse hold your hand? Turns out, if the nurse held your hand, it hurts less, 
And it's actually sometimes been found to be more effective, that you actually feel better, but you're actually able to marshal an immune response that's actually more powerful than if you don't have the social support of a, of a kind other. Really interesting literature on the way wives can support husbands during um, uh, medical procedures. Funnily enough, it doesn't work quite with shame strength the other way around. <laughs> but it is, it, this is massive literature on the social support, the social buffer hypothesis, the social support given by uh, those that we care about and that care about us in the face of stressors. You can get people to plunge their hands into cold water, you can give them mild electric shocks, you can give them scary news, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff that social psychologists do, that developmental psychologists blessedly do not do. But the point is, you can do all these really interesting experiments that show that having another person with you substantially reduces the experience of stress, but actually it reduces the physiological wear and tear of stress on the system. And that's what we think is happening in preschools when the climate is positive, when teachers are offering really routinized and, and calm, structured supports for kids' self-regulation. But how can we build that into the system earlier upstream, and how can we capitalize on the resources in kids' lives like their families? That's primarily the logic behind supporting parenting interventions, is by really providing and bol bolstering uh, the support that's already there, but that can sometimes be suppressed, because moms and dads in poverty are also experiencing that wear and tear, are also experiencing difficulties with their executive function, are also having trouble reading emotional signals in, in the most positive ways. They too are struggling with those same stressors. So we're running um, an intervention now in New York City uh, called the ABC study. It's uh, funded by the US Department of Health and Human Services. It's under um, something called the Buffering Toxic Stress Consortium. And it's basically implementing um, a video feedback-based intervention where we show moms a clip of uh, parenting that we'd like them to learn a little bit about, about how to read your baby's signals, for example, and how to connect to your baby and have a good connection. And then we actually videotape moms while they do that task and show moms the tape so that they can see how great a job they do, but we can also give a little coaching to show some areas where they can actually strengthen those skills. Um, what we're really interested in finding out is not only what is the cost of poverty-related stress to moms, de um, depressive symptoms and anxiety, and to kids' physiology, but also what is the impact of the intervention in terms of leading to repair for both moms and babies in terms of their stress reactivity and their executive function. And that's with low-income Latina moms in a number of different sites all over New York, and I can talk more about it if I have time. Lastly, do they like it? It turns out they love it. Um, how do we embed that in a public policy way so that it's not just the few families that I can reach with my intervention, but that could actually be at, uh, uh, dosed at the population level? So the first thing is to really think about a public health-based approach to getting the message out. Um, you know in New York there's been a big push to talk to your baby, for example, to really increase and boost the amount of uh, parental language and parental support to infants. You could also boost moderate intensity services. One of the key thing that we're learning in New York is simply getting low-income families enrolled in high-quality free preschool services is a big task and it's an important one for us to think through the policy challenges and the policy solutions too. And then there are a whole host of interventions that I've listed there that you can um, learn more about or that I can talk about if I have time. Finally, we have to think about high-intensity services that are really trauma-informed for families at higher risk. So it may be that families who've been experiencing multiple amounts of domestic violence or, or, or community violence are not going to be able to benefit from a low dose, basically. Um, what can we do uh, to support those families? And we have some great models that have been developed, actually, uh, both for um, urban uh, communities, um, particularly experiencing a lot of violence, but also for National Guard and Reserve troops uh, that include the same video feedback approach. Stop. Yes. Lastly, I just will point out that the question really comes down to how bold we're willing to be. Um, it's clearly, to turn the tide, we have to think about uh, basically building in anti-poverty effort in terms of in economic self-sufficiency for families. And the way that we've been thinking about that in our program is really to build district-level investments in early education to two-generation anti-poverty effort and understanding community safety and empowerment as central to child and parent um, uh, success rather than something we'll get to down the line. So with that, thank you very much. Tons of information if you're interested, and it's been really a pleasure and honor.
co-host Dr. Raver. And uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Emily Dropkin and Ebony Howard. Uh, Emily Dropkin is the Director of Policy, Data, and Research at the National Head Start Association. Ebony Howard, as you already know, I'm sure, is a managing research and early childhood specialist at AIR. Um, I will start with uh, Emily. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Great. Um, so I'm Emily Dropkin. I'm the Director of Policy, Data, and Research with the National Head Start Association. I should say before I did this, I was a special education teacher in Baltimore City, and I could give you a whole different response from that perspective, but I'll stick with this for today. Um, I want to first thank uh, the American Institutes of Research for hosting this conversation and Sibel and her colleagues for their extraordinary work. Um, for a long time, the public conversation about research and Head Start has been focused only on the Head Start Impact Study and not on these lessons that we can draw from the best Head Start programs and interventions. Um, and these really can help us improve the experiences of kids across the country. Um, as I start, we've been talking a lot in Head Start this year about our 50th anniversary. And I want to read you a little bit from something that Robert Cook of Johns Hopkins uh, drafted in a memo for his friend Sergeant Shriver, the panel of his colleagues, uh, 50 years and about three months ago. And he began with this. One, there is considerable evidence that the early years of childhood are the most critical point in the poverty cycle. During these years, the creation of learning patterns, emotional development, and the formation of individual expectations and aspirations takes place at a very rapid pace. For the child of poverty, there are clearly observable deficiencies in the processes, which lay the foundation for a pattern of failure and thus a pattern of poverty throughout the child's entire life. Two, within recent years, there has been experimentation and research designed to improve opportunities for the child of poverty. While much of this work is not yet complete, there is adequate evidence to support the view that special programs can be devised for these four and five-year-olds, which will improve both the child's opportunities and achievements. Three, it is clear that successful programs of this type must be comprehensive, involving activities generally associated with the fields of health, social services, and education. Similarly, it is clear that the program must focus on the problems of child and parent, and that these activities need to be carefully integrated with programs for the school years. Uh, the title of the memo was Recommendations for a Head Start Program, um, and it's a vision that has carried Head Start forward for all of the years since. Uh, the only dramatic addition has been the integration of uh, Early Head Start about 20 years ago, which serves uh, prenatal mothers and infants and toddlers. Um, and that first summer, just a few months after they wrote that, uh, they served 500,000 children in Head Start programs across the country. And today we serve uh, just over a million infants, toddlers, and preschool children, although we know uh, from the data you showed us that there is still this dramatic need um, among eligible children and families. Um, but Sabelle's presentation today is a welcome addition to the still developing and even then undeniable body of research that tells us that to help children be successful, we have to start early and embrace whole families and communities with comprehensive supports. She also offers something that I know the Head Start field is always hungry for, the means to actually understand and explain and intensify the work that we do, uh, particularly focusing right now on the challenges that uh, teachers find among the kids in their classrooms around stress and behavioral health needs, and recognizing that the families who come to us um, are at a pivotal point in their development where we can offer all kinds of resources related to everything from mental health to workforce and education training uh, that can help them be more stable in the long term. We know that the early adverse experiences described in today's session are a daily reality for a lot of our children. Um, and when I was first new at the National Head Start Association, I organized an event for some adult graduates of Head Start. Uh, and I'll never forget how one woman, Lucy, began her story. She was crying as she came up to the podium and described uh, the alcoholism and domestic violence and hunger that had ravaged her childhood home. And vividly remembered coming down the street and her Head Start teacher standing in the doorway and giving her a hug every day when she got there. Uh, Isabel mentioned how important nurturing relationships with healthy adults are to child development. And that connection is what we so often hear when we talk to adults who've been part of Head Start. But even beyond that, what these findings tell us is that something is something that feels intuitive, I think, when we hear it. That children's lives are made up of experiences, both good and bad, that shape their trajectories. There's never been a single program or a single policy at any age that can wipe out the cumulative damage of repeated exposure to trauma and violence. 
Many of the longer term Head Start effects are probably rooted in the changes in development and family stability that we give them the tools themselves to endure even after the children leave a center. But the quality of schools, the levels of community violence, environmental risks also have to be part of our vision for how we enable children's success in the long term. One of the wonderful elements of Head Start since its birth is a belief in continuous learning from research like we've been fortunate to hear about today. Um, and so six weeks ago, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, who herself was a Head Start child uh, and described her teacher to us when she came to the National Head Start Association Conference a few months ago, um, she, she unveiled the notice of proposed rulemaking for revised Head Start standards. The updating of the standards offers us an opportunity to incorporate all the best lessons of research and innovation into what we try to offer every child and family who enters Head Start. In particular, there's been a focus on keeping space available for children who are homeless or in foster care so that more of the children who face that largest number of risk factors will be able to access services right away. As the Head Start community comes together to reflect on the proposals and comment on how to strengthen the program, we're returning again to the questions at our roots. What do children need for healthy development? What do parents need to be engaged and empowered? And how do these needs vary based on family and community strengths? At the same time, this new research and, conversation, and our conversations about the standards remind us what we risk as a country if we fail to invest well in our children. The proposed standards would increase the number of days and hours of services children receive, strengthen professional support for staff, ensure research-based curricula, and align each program's goals with the Early Learning Outcomes Framework, uh, which includes areas related to social-emotional development and well-being. But without new funding, these standards come at a cost. The administration's estimate, which is low, is that over 126,000 children and families will lose services. With millions of eligible children already unserved on our waiting lists, this becomes an ethical dilemma with consequences for them and their children in turn. Uh, responding to the standards, and comments are due in two weeks if you want to weigh in, uh, forces us to address how we balance what we believe is best for all children with wanting to reach as many as possible. And to get to, your, to the earlier question about uh, policy, we've known since 1965, since Robert Cook wrote it down with a, a number of his other colleagues, um, what the essence of what we should be doing is. Uh, but we have to find ways to make that happen. Even on the maps we saw of Chicago, there could have been another layer of dots with all of the children who were on waiting lists and never made it into programs mm -hmm. uh, that could have met their needs. So how do we make sure that no child lacks what he or she needs to be successful? I think it rests with all of us to be advocates uh, here, but also in the larger conversations that go on about how we invest as a country. But let me say something else about resilience before I finish. Uh, my favorite thing about the story I told you about Lucy is that I was the, the peon at the time, organizing everybody, getting them all uh, ready to go. And Lucy came and found me afterwards because she knew me to say that to, to let me know that she, she was sorry for crying, which I assured her was fine, um, but to tell me that she hadn't been crying because of what she was saying. Uh, she had come to terms over the years with what had gone on in her childhood. She was actually crying because the young man who spoke before her um, was a Head Start kid. He just, was just about to graduate high school, and his speech was about how he has Asperger's syndrome, and how Head Start had helped his mother understand what he needed, get the resources to support him, um, and to actually enroll in college and, and get her degree herself. Um, at the time of the event, he was about to graduate high school and enter training as an EMT, which was what the goal he had set for himself. And she was crying because today she's a Head Start teacher, and she had a child in her classroom who had just been diagnosed as on the autism spectrum. And she was so moved by this example that he had set, and so full of hope. I love both of their stories because they remind us of what Robert Cook told us 50 years ago and what Sibel told us today, which is that we know what to do, and if we're willing to invest the time and energy and money in those comprehensive supports to young children and their families and their communities, we can open a window of opportunity for them to be successful throughout their lives. As we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Head Start and turn clear eye to the desperate need we see in so many communities, we invite you to join us and our commitment to children. Thank you. Thank you, Ebony. 50 years of Head Start, 70 years for AIR, is that right? Is it 70? Mm -hmm. Next year. Wow, next year. And what I've struck by is one of the takeaways that Sabelle said is 
more pores in the water. After 50, 70 years, inequality, more ores in the water. And my question, or my comment, I guess, is how many more ores do we need? Who's willing to pick up the ores? And where are we going? Where are we going? We can pick up ores, every single one in this room, and are we going to go to where we think we need to go? And I'm going to tell you where I think we need to go. We need to go to a place that's going to make a difference for these young children. And in 50 years, the first slide that Sabelle started off with the poverty rate among young children hasn't changed. It's gotten worse. So we are either, one, are not having ores in the water, ores is not what we need, or people aren't picking up their load to do something. And we do know what to do. Wait, one thing we have is we know what to do. We want to know that there does have a big difference that we can make in young children's lives from the very beginning. So to the point of, oh, what do we need? What do children need that you made, right? What matters for kids? We know what matters for kids. And we have such great evidence now, such great evidence about things like executive functioning and how important it is, what the neurons and the development of young children's brains are, and the impact of their environment, of their context in which they live, matters from the very early days of their lives. And yet here we are with this conversation. I mean, I'm almost like ready to cry. If you see me shaking, it's not I'm nervous. I'm really like, filled with emotion about what do we do to move the needle here? How do we take our ores and really go in a direction? And it's not just going around in circles or it's not just getting stuck in a bank on the side of the river. And the people standing on the side, I'm taking this metaphor really far. <laughs> <laughs> but we're all standing there going move, you know? And maybe we're pushing a little this way and then somebody else is pushing the opposite way that we're pushing and we get stuck right in the middle. And so if we came back, how many people here have kids? No kids. Do you know any kids out there? There's got to be, oh, well, that's a problem right there. Get to know a child. So for those who are remote, I'm sure everybody who was remote put up a whole bunch of hands, but I saw five hands go up. Now, OK, now really answer. Who knows some kids? Awesome. Was anybody themselves a child? <laughs> Yeah, and if you yourself as a child think back what mattered for you, that got you to be in a place here at AIR to listen to such a great presentation and figure about all those kids and adults who were not in the room, were either one, struggling with the issue, or two, trying to figure out how to move the issue and move the needle. So, you know, my question and comment is what can we do, those who have been a kid or have kids, no kids, to pick up an oar, or a tool, or jump in the water yourself and just learn how to swim so that we can move the needle. And then we're not here in our 120th anniversary, or the 100th anniversary, talking the same old thing. About 25% of children less than age six in poverty and suffering with the consequences of poverty. It's not just income, it is stress, it's violence. Um, it, in the back of the uh, paper you guys have picked up, there's a whole list of indicators of which all relate to poverty and inequality issues. And the fact that kids grow up in that environment and that they don't have the opportunities because they're squashed because of all those indicators is something that we need to really figure out how to make a change. Um, there's some powerful words there. Well, I um, am mindful of the time and the exciting cocktails that may be uh, coming. So I will um, uh, take some questions. I wanted to just say, please keep your questions in the form of a question. And we're going to do like a lightning round so we can get like as many questions as possible. And also, I've been told that we might be able to get some questions in from the folks who are, who are listening remotely. Um, but here, I see a question. Yeah, so already. we have 15 minutes, I'll yeah. say. And those who are remotely, there's like a chat box. You can type in those questions. And then I'm 
heard, they'll magically appear for us to read. So please chat away. Okay, great. I'll just uh, start in the back. Um, obviously, what you said was exactly why maybe most of us are here, and um, I agree with your question. I'm kind of just asking the same question he asked earlier about policy because it's very obvious that it's needed. All these things, all the research evidence is there, but nothing has been moving on. If anything, you hear about a lot of cuts. So it's a great concern. Um, I, it's, it's, I don't know, to me it's very obvious. I don't know if it's obvious to everybody else, but if it's needed at the foundation, um, but we don't do anything about it on a policy level, it's like, it doesn't make sense to me. So I'm sorry that it's not a real, real question, but I'm kind of still asking a question. Like, what, Which what is, is what, what, do we, what do we need to do to be encouraging different policy? What, yeah, how what do is, we, what is okay, solution? great, let's take that question. Sure, so I think it's really great for us to just take a minute and think about what sectors those policies are in. So we talked about the education sector. So up until now, preschool, kids age four, didn't count in the education sector. They counted a lot in the Head Start sector, which is funded through the administration for um, children, which is in the health sector, right? So it's a huge step forward that we even pay for kids going to preschools in the education sector. That is a big, huge step forward. What that means is when you hear debates and discussions in your community about increasing taxes to pay for schooling, that's what that money could be going for. And pushing hard for that to be happening in your community is a huge step forward, right? So just covering little kids in schools is a big policy implication. That's true in cities, that's true in states, and that's true federally. So policy, you know, Obama's policies around early childhood are to push for coverage of four-year-olds in the K-12 schooling system, which means it wouldn't be called K-12 anymore, it'd be called UPK to 12 or early 12, something new that we can't even imagine, right? The second thing is home visiting. That's a second sector that we think a lot about. That used to be used for treating single adolescent moms who had babies out of wedlock. That's where that model came from. It's now we moved into a place of universal services for first time moms across the board who might need extra help. What does that mean? That is revolutionary for us to say that it is part of a national public health campaign that you should get a phone call or some contact with somebody to check in on whether you're depressed, whether you have concerns or questions about your baby, whether you'd like to know a little bit about breastfeeding, etc., whether you'd like to stop smoking. That may have major health benefit for moms and for babies and substantial anti-poverty consequences. But right now, our, our framing of that is still that it's for only very high-risk families, not that it is actually part of the way that we deliver public health. So those are two sectors that could change dramatically. If we think about it differently, if we make different expectations of our policy leaders and our public officials at the really local level, um, what's going on in your local hospital? What's going on in your local maternity ward? What's going on in your local WIC office? Check those things out. That is where these questions get answered at the local policy level. Uh, please. Hi, uh, two quick questions for Sabell. My name is Tom Tock. I'm with Georgetown University. Uh, one, I noticed uh, on your last slide there that you're actively seeking high schools to participate in uh, mindset interventions, which leads me to ask how ask you to explain how the work of Carol Dweck and her colleagues at Stanford, David Yeager, uh, uh, Dave Panescu, Greg Wolf, and others, uh, who are working in the mindset, with mindset interventions and, and uh, belongingness uh, strategies, how that overlays with your work on uh, sort of neurobiological stressors. And then secondly, uh, it's more of a political question since all three of you are, are focused on the, the sort of political dimension of this conversation. Uh, how do you respond uh, as an advocate of um, uh, interventions uh, to overcome the stressors of, of poverty to those like Joel Klein uh, in New York uh, and others who argue that uh, schools paying attention to the consequences of, of poverty uh, allow many educators to excuse themselves from the uh, tough job of educating kids to high standards, especially disadvantaged kids. Yeah, 
Sure, great questions. The um, answer to the first one is simply that as we followed our Chicago kids as they got older, it felt uh, morally uh, wrong to just study how kids were doing. Uh, and even though I'd given uh, a big in in input in terms of the intervention in preschool, um, it seemed like absolutely the right time to basically give kids exposure to one more boost, one more dose of intervention of support, particularly as they're getting college and career ready, and particularly as I saw our kids, our 600 kids, launching on their earnings trajectories. I thought, what could we do that would maybe even possibly give them a little extra boost in terms of going to college or being career ready? And the work that I came across that was most compelling and that was easiest to administer or implement was the mindset work. It turned out that the mindset work that some, many of you may be familiar with is actually very related to adults' decision making uh, and young uh, and, and middle schoolers and high schoolers' decision making in the context of uh, really investing effort versus giving up, which seemed exactly applicable to what I was seeing among young parents in my samples. So it, immediately the connection was really clear that that mindset work could be very well uh, tailored to low-income adults, not just low-income adolescents, particularly um, because in, in David's view, it really is about building trust and a sense of belonging in institutions that have basically failed you in the past. Um, that sounded exactly like the experiences of the families in my studies, and what I did not want to be the experience of the 600 kids in my sample. So we are now currently tailoring the mindset with David um, Yeager for our sample um, to be implemented. I shouldn't be saying this too loudly because I don't want you all to go tell my sample <laughs> that they're about to get mindset, um, but it's to say that uh, we're now working in New York City to really test out um, how that model works with kids who have been excluded uh, or marginalized academically in many ways. So that's step one, answer one. Answer two um, is the issue of accountability, not just for kids, but accountability, I think, for teachers. And do teachers and systems use the worries about toxic stress and poverty as a dodge uh, for the ways in which they're being held responsible? It's been my experience in the New York City universe that teachers actually take the responsibility of serving um, low-income kids extremely seriously and they need as many tools as they can get to be able to do the very, very hard jobs that they have. I will say it's been very impressive to me in working with the New York City schools and DOE to see in which the way in which the job of teacher has changed dramatically. It's not being the lone isolated instructor in the front of the class. It's working organizationally and systematically with lots of other teachers to come up with a whole suite of, of services and supports for kids who are struggling. Um, and I've been visiting a lot of high schools in New York lately and I've been very impressed by the consistency with which I see that. So I don't know about Klein's concerns uh, that, that poverty is going to be used as a dodge. I don't see that in my um, daily contact with teachers and principals. We're going to try to get another question. Yes. Um, I work for Kaboom, a nonprofit that promotes play, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on utilizing play as a solution to address toxic stress in young children. So great question. Um, play has been um, alternately elevated and maligned in lots of policy discussions about what's the right curriculum. Play is absolutely essential for children's ability to explore and expand um, their environments and pretend play, particularly when it's structured well, has been shown in our work and others um, in terms of the tools of the mind curriculum to support executive function. <coughs> what's important is that play needs to be structured so that it's really active and engaging and uh, cognitively challenging and enriching and not simply uh, uh, just a, a label to custodial care where kids are supposed to sort of evaporate out of adult space and go do their thing. Um, there are not enough uh, really supportive and positive uh, places to play in low-income communities because of um, the way in which we uh, design the space. So low-income kids definitely need more safe and supportive places to play. Okay, one more question. Um, in your intervention with the preschoolers, can you explain to us how you've noticed gains in executive function among three and four year olds if they stop having trouble tantrums? <laughs> Good question. We actually did a very, very intensive, um, a methodologically sort of rich uh, data collection effort at the fall and in the spring for those kids. Um, specifically, we collected data from their teachers. We collected data by watching them um, have tantrums or not in the classroom, but what we really did was 
a huge battery of executive function and emotional self-control measures, including a variation of the marshmallow task. Um, we uh, Basically, that's our bread and butter in my field, is to develop those measures and to use them constantly all over the place. So, you know, I can get you all to do an executive function task with pencils right now, but I don't think we have the time. Um, we just love doing that. And so we had direct assessments where we would literally say, I'm going to tap my pencil one time, and when I do that, I want you to tap your pencil two times. When I tap my pencil two times, I want you to tap your pencil one time. That involves executive function. Kids have to attend to the rule, they have to really remember the rule, and then they have to inhibit the impulse to just tap like crazy, or to tap the way we tap. So something as simple as that it serves as a very helpful indicator of executive function. We now have them on tablets, so we can actually use a tablet-based assessment strategy that we hope we can get um, teachers to use to just take the pulse, not to do any kind of crazy high-stakes accountability, but just to take the pulse of kids' um, executive function in their classrooms. Can, um, okay, sure. Any other questions? Sure. Um, two questions. Is having, um, my question is, does having more school psychologists in lower income schools mitigate the stress that young children face as well as the brain damage that can be caused by that stress? Excellent question. Does having more psycholo school psychologists in schools, absolutely, more psychologists would really help when they're well trained and when they're connected and when they're trusted. So I have a great colleague named Elise Capella and she works with someone named Mark Atkins and they do a lot of work on school uh, psychologists as consultants who really provide a ton of uh, professional development and support to teachers um, while also serving as a really trusted uh, resource for kids. Um, and we have a lot of uh, faith in school psychologists to carry out that work, but they need a lot of training and support so that they know what they're, what they're tackling and what, how to handle it. Um, well, I wanted to thank everybody for uh, joining us today. It's a wonderful conversation, and I can tell that it could go on for a while. Um, but it was a pleasure to uh, listen to the presentations, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm.